Amen. Amen. There was a, uh, there was a, a time that I would try to explain um, math to people. And I would try to explain it in the best terms that I possibly could. It was something that I grew up and it came natural to me. And so people would ask me, hey, could you tell me how to figure out this problem? And I would tell them, and telling them typically did not go the way I intended for it to go. Very rarely did people catch on to what I was telling them. But every once in a while, I find myself deciding that maybe if I show them the problem, it might actually help a little bit. And so we would work problems together. I would work alongside them and show them how the problem was done. Step by step, we would walk together through the problem. And typically when we did that, they still didn't get it. No, I'm playing. Typically when we did that, they would, they would get it, right? Because, because oftentimes it's, it's, it's things that are shown to us that we catch versus things that are just told to us, versus things that are just explained to us. Sometimes the best way to learn something is to watch somebody else do it, right? And so for the next month, a little bit over, we're going we're gonna to take some deliberate time in our, in, in, in our teaching time and in our sermon time to, as a church, watch other people do this. And so this is a deliberate time of prayer for us this month. We're calling it uh, our 40-day prayer challenge. It began on July the 1st. You are welcome to join in if you have not joined in yet. But in this prayer challenge and during this time of prayer, what we're going to be doing is we're going to actually be looking at other people pray. And the first person that we're going to be looking at pray is Paul. Paul is one of the greatest missionaries of, of, in the history of the church, if not the greatest missionary in the history of the church. And Paul prays often in Scripture. We find him in his letters. They're, they're called epistles. We find him in his epistles often saying, I pray for you, and I pray for you in this way. And in this letter this morning, the second letter to the church at Thessalonica, he is praying a prayer. And I want to read through that prayer, and I want to ask some questions of that prayer. But before I ask some questions of that prayer, I want to just ask some questions of you. If I, if, I was to make, if I was to ask you to make a list of the top three things that you spend time praying to God about right now, what would they be? Top three. You, you can pull out a pencil, pen, write it down if you want to. Brother George already gave us a top one, family. Matter of fact, when you look at a survey, a 2014 survey by LifeWay, there was a, there was a list of like the top 10 things that, that people are praying for on a day-to-day -day basis, on a regular basis. At the top of the list was family, family and friends, top of the list. Second was their own problems and their own difficulties. I can relate to that. Many, many of us in this room can relate to that. And then the third thing was the good things that occurred in their life. So it's their family, their friends, their own problems, their own difficulties, and the good things that occurred. They would pray prayers of thanksgiving, so to speak, and thank God for intervening for them. I think that's a pretty accurate list. Uh, number four was their sin. Number five was natural disasters. That sounds about right. Maybe some of us offered a few prayers this week in light of California, seeing not one but two earthquakes. One on the six-point uh, um, rating of the Richter scale, the other on the seven-point rating of the Richter scale. So, so all of these prayers that are offered seem like reasonable prayers, but what I want to do over the next, next several weeks is spend time learning what are some things we should pray for and how should we pray for them. And I want to watch other people pray in order to do that. So to begin this conversation, we want to look at the very last two verses in, in this chapter of Thessalonians. Paul says, to this end, we always pray for you, 
that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul provides us in these two verses a what to pray in order to pray like him. But here's another question for you this morning. We see the what but before we dive too far into prayer, the question I want to ask is, what is the state of mind that leads us to pray like Paul prays? Because Paul gives that as well in this chapter. And so in other words, what I want to look at this morning is two things. One, what is the content of the prayer? That's the what that we see in verses 11 and 12. But what is the context of Paul's prayer? The state of mind as he prays. Since the, con the context actually sets the state of mind. And the context actually fuels the content. So that's the, that's the question we want to start with, is what is the context, context rather? What is Paul's prayerful state of mind as he prays? Pay attention to Paul's words in verse 11, the very beginning. It says, to this end, we always pray for you. To what end? is the question. That's where context is being set. Paul says, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to pray to this end. In other words, my mind is shaped in such a way that it leads me to pray these particular prayers that I'm praying. Does that make sense? So these words tell, show us that Paul has a certain state of mind at work that leads him to pray in the way that he play, prays. So what is that state of mind? Verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So Paul prays first with the state of mind of thanks. Paul has a state of mind of thanks. Thanks for what? Thanks for the church's growing and increasing maturity in God. He says that he gives thanks to God for the brothers, as is right, because their faith is growing and the love of every one of them for one another is increasing. It's not just the fact that he's thankful that should get our attention. It's what he's thankful for that should get our attention. The Thessalonians' faith is growing and the Thessalonians' love for each other is increasing. To say it another way, Paul is constantly thanking God that the Christians in Thessalonica are maturing in their walk with Jesus. They're growing in their walk with Jesus because the walk of Jesus is about faith and it's about love. It's about faith in him, trust in him, love for him, and then it's about love for one another and love for neighbor. One of the theologians, uh, one of the great theologians of our day, D.A. Carson, once said, what you thank God for testifies to what you actually value. What you thank God for testifies to actually what you value in life. And to highlight that point, Carson refers to this conversation that he has with Christians oftentimes about their kids as, as, as they're getting older. Conversation kind of goes like this. So, so yeah, brother, brother so-and-so, how is Johnny doing? Brother so-and-so responds, oh, Johnny is doing great. He just graduated from MIT, and, and he's now working in a Fortune 500 tech firm. And, 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 and he says, oh, well, that's great. So, so how is Susie doing? And, and, and brother and so-and-so brother, and brother so -and -so says, oh, Susie is doing absolutely wonderful. She's studying for her PhD at Cambridge, and she's near completion. And, and then the conversation takes a shift over to spiritual matters. And Dr. Carson says, he asks, so how... So have they found a good church, and are they getting plugged in yet? And brother so-and-so responds, well, well, they haven't really been attending church very much. It's just been, you know, too busy. They've been so busy. And I suppose at some point in their career when things settle down, maybe they'll come back, and, and maybe they'll start attending church. What's wrong with this picture? 
Certainly there's nothing wrong with being excited about your children doing well in their, in their professions. And certainly there's nothing wrong with being excited about your children doing well in school. But what is their attention most fixed on in their children? How are, how are you determining whether or not your child is doing well? In other words, would they be so quick to see or would they be so quick to say that the child was doing well if they only carried a high school diploma, but they carried a real bona fide relationship and love for Jesus Christ? See, the one whose eyes are fixed on eternity is far more grieved that their children don't know the Lord than their children know computer science or don't know computer science. And they are far more inclined to offer thanks for the simple fact that, they cho that their children know God and are called into relationship with God than, they, than the more celebrated fact that they know how to turn profits for a company. What we celebrate most testifies to what we value the most. What we offer thanksgiving for most testifies to what we value the most. So let me ask you a question. When you pray, what are you thanking God for most prominently and most, and most frequently? What are you thanking God for? Are you thanking him for life, for money, for health, and strength? All those are good things to thank God for, but are you also thanking God for salvation? The fact that you know him and he knows you. The fact that he's rescued you through the blood of Jesus Christ? What about the fact that you, that you, that you have, have seen salvation in the life of others? Are you thanking him for that? Are you thanking him for the fact that you see growth and maturity in other people, in him? Are you thanking him for the fact that they are growing in his knowledge and maturing in their love for one another? As Paul prays, his mind is fixed on the maturation of the believers around him. He is grateful that through hardship and through suffering and through persecution, the Thessalonians trust in God and, his, and their love for God and their love for one another has actually increased rather than decreased. He is grateful that through hardship, suffering, and persecution, which by the way is a recipe for relational conflict, their love for one another is not shrinking, their love for one another is growing. Don't miss the fact that this is the posture that Paul is praying, and he feels like he's obligated to take this posture. He says, we ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers. Not only, not only is this the type of thanksgiving that Paul says he should be thinking um, to give them from time to time, Paul says this is the kind of thanksgiving I should be always looking to give you. This ought to be my natural bend in prayer is to be thanking God for the people around me growing in God. Does that make sense? Are you wired to give thanksgiving in this way? Is this your natural bend? Are you wired to give thanksgiving at all? Is that your natural bend? What does your practice of thanksgiving currently say about your heart? What else does Paul teach us about thanksgiving? Verse 4, he says, therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. enduring. Paul moves from thanksgiving to boast, and that is shaping his state of mind as he prays. Now, of course, when we typically think, typically think about boasting, it is self-centered, right? I mean, we boast, on, we boast on our skills on the basketball court, whether we're good or not, Right? This is the season where many of us have boasted much about our barbecuing skills, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's fine. I mean, I could cook better than all y'all, but that's, you know, we'll talk about that later, right? But it's fine to boast about your barbecue skills. It's fine to boast about your basketball court skills and all that. But, but, but this boasting is, of course, more lighthearted. But then there's a more serious and a more dangerous type of boasting in ourselves where when it comes to how much more beautiful we are than the next person or how much more better or how just how better we are than other people around us. 
And so boasting by its default posture is something that is self-centered. We, we are oftentimes, when we listen to our culture's music, it is defined by a self-boast. And if it isn't boasting, it is viewed as almost like out of step with, with the culture. It's like, well, that's a different song. I've never heard a song like that on the radio before. It sounds outdated. It sounds foreign. So, so, but, but here Paul's prayer life is set in the midst of boasting, but take notice at the what he is boasting in. Two things. One, steadfastness through tribulations. That the church is remaining steadfast in God through persecution, through hardship, through tribulations. And two, faith through hardship. That the church remains trusting Jesus even when the going gets tough. Paul is not boasting in how awesome he is, nor is Paul superficially and surface level boasting in how awesome they are. Paul is boasting that though they are being stricken down for the love that they carry for Jesus, they haven't quit. And though they are being beaten down for the love that they possess for Jesus, they haven't left him. They are still moving forward, and they are still moving in him. And Paul is boasting that though they are suffering because they have laid claim to Christ as Lord, they aren't losing their trust in God. They are still holding on to his promise that he is with them and will never leave nor forsake them. Let me ask you another question. How often do you celebrate the faith and steadfastness of the other Christians around you? Paul is basically saying as we go to other churches, we can't wait to brag about what God is doing in y'all. How through hardships and the storms of life, y'all you you, you, ain't quitting on Jesus. You're pushing through, and even though life has been extremely hard for y'all, you haven't lost your hope in Christ. You've instead continued to cling to him. When's the last time that was a prayer of yours? When was the last time that was a posture of yours where you were thanking God for the steadfastness of another brother and sister around you? Where you were saying, man, they've gone through so much, and yet they continue to show up. They continue to trust God. They continue to hold on. When's the last time you went to a brother or sister and just said, man, I've noticed you. I've noticed how hard it's been, and I've noticed you stuck with it. And I just want to tell you to keep going. God sees it. When is the last three times you took note of some Christian around you who remained strong through hardship and then went on to brag about the Spirit's work in the life of that Christian to other people? This is the posture that's shaping Paul's life. This is the posture that's shaping Paul's prayers. And then lastly, Paul's heart in prayer is shaped by his hope in God's vindication. In verses 5 through 9, we see this. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. See, Paul's heart in prayer is shaped by thanksgiving for their growing maturation in God, and it's also shaped by, uh, shaped by his boasting and their steadfastness in God. But these, these two qualities here that he's highlighting are actually evidence of a third thing, a third quality that is shaping Paul's prayers. Most of us struggle with this third thing. Most of us struggle with the problem of evil, period. We don't understand why it exists and, and what we are to actually do with it. And it becomes even more troubling for, for most of us and many of us when we see it happen to people who are truly seeking to live a life that's pleasing to God. Many watch people that are walking with God suffer and see it as evidence that God has either left the show or he never was a part of it. But Paul, however, turns the tables with these words in verses 5 through 9. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul says that the steadfastness and the maturation that the Thessalonian church is displaying in the midst of affliction is evidence, listen, 
evidence that God knows what he is doing in picking them. That the suffering is serving as proof that they are in fact gods and that they have been counted worthy to be named inheritors of the kingdom of God. Paul tells the Philippian church the same thing in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. He says this, listen to this. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightening anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, listen, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. See, suffering for Christ and suffering with Christ is Paul's proof that you've been counted worthy to also reign with Christ. Another great theologian by the name of John Stott, he, he, he articulates it in this way. Listen to this. It takes spiritual discern, discernment to see in a situation of injustice, like the persecution of the innocent, evidence of the just judgment of God. Our habit is to see only the surface appearance and to, and to so make only superficial comments. So when we see malice and cruelty and power and the arrogance of evil men who persecute, we see also the sufferings of the people of God who are opposed, ridiculed, boycotted, harassed, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. And we are tempted to invade against God and the miscarriage of justice. We say, why doesn't God do something indignantly? And the answer is that he is doing something and will go on doing it. He is allowing his people to suffer in order to qualify them for a heavenly kingdom. He is allowing the wicked to triumph, triumph temporarily, but his just judgment will fall upon them in the end. Thus, Paul sees evident, evidence that God's judgment is right in the very situation in which we might see nothing but injustice. See, our current age is very uncomfortable with this whole idea that suffering is doing something. But Paul says exactly that in these words. You don't have to listen to me. You can read them for yourself. Our current age is very uncomfortable with the words that Paul uses in this chapter about vindication and vengeance because our culture is very uncomfortable with the ideal of ret uh, retributive punishment or retributive punishment, rather. As D.A. Carson says when he talks about this passage, many hear this passage that we're reading and they say, I thought this eye for eye stuff was in the Old Testament. However, God doesn't view retribution as cruel. God views us getting back what we put out as actual justice. I recently saw a man who was given probation for sexually assaulting a young girl. probation for taking the innocence of a child. And I didn't read that and feel good about it. I didn't read that and feel comfort. I read that and I felt holy anger because I wanted justice to be served. His crime was not met with an equivalent punishment. And so we all know that Retribution is, is just a part of how justice is distributed. But we just have a problem with it. But folks, this is what makes forgiveness that Jesus grants you so powerful. Because in salvation, Christ takes what you and I deserve. See, if you don't understand retribution, then you don't understand the cross. In the cross, retribution is served, but is served on the one who was innocent in favor of the guilty. And so you're granted grace and you're granted mercy because what was owed to you in retribution for your offense towards God was taken upon Jesus Christ out of love for you. See, when we, and, 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 and this is what makes the gospel the necessary thing for our salvation. See, all of us are guilty. 
Every single one of us have, has done dirt. None of us, none of us walk in this room clean. All of us have done dirt. But on the cross, he gets what we deserve. But when we reject that good news, when we reject his life, death, burial, and resurrection, we reject the offering that he offers on our behalf. And now what we deserve gets placed back on our backs. That's what makes the cross, that's what makes the gospel so powerful. What Paul is saying here is that the state of mind that he enters prayer with is that no matter what suffering we may experience in this life, God will right it. No matter what injury that may be inflicted upon you, God will settle it. Either he will settle it upon the backs of the offenders or he will settle it upon the backs of, uh, on the back of his son because the offenders will go to his son and they will accept his sacrifice on their behalf. But justice will be served. And so Paul enters prayer saying, yes, I know you're hurting. And yes, I know things have not always gone the right way in life. But I praise God that he's maturing you. I praise God that he's doing so much work in your life. And I praise God that justice will truly, once and for all, have the final say. See, in examining the state of mind that leads Paul to pray, the unsettling conclusion that we are left with is that many times we aren't even starting in the right place to experience a healthy prayer life. The perceived gifts that we receive in life that motivate us towards thanksgiving are too small. The character qualities in us and others that we boast about are too self-centered. And the stuff that gives us hope is too consumed with the right now. It is this small, self-centered, momentary satisfaction for the right now frame of mind that shapes our prayer life. And should we all be that really surprised <laughs> that our prayers turn out to be small, self-centered, and focus so much on the right now, rather than God-sized and selfless and eternally focused? Should we be surprised when that's our frame of mind? If we take time to evaluate Paul's posture in prayer, what we discover is that we don't just need help to actually pray the right things. We need help with the mindset that we take to prayer. Does that make sense? How would your prayers change if you entered into prayer the way Paul is entering into prayer in this moment? What kind of intercession would you be making con constantly and relentlessly for, the, for other people around you if you took the mindset into prayer that Paul is taking into prayer in this moment? If our mindset is transformed for prayer, then our prayers will be transformed. Do you understand that? If our mindset is transformed, then our prayers will be transformed to something more substan substantial, something more life-altering, something more life-giving, something more eternal, which leads us to the final focus this morning, and I'll spend brief moments on this, but the actual prayer, the what? The what? Paul says, to this end, to the end that we just talked about, with this frame of mind, I pray. We pray. First of all, Paul says we always pray. Prayer is relentless. Prayer is constant. Prayer is unceasing. Paul urges the Ephesians in Ephesians 6 to keep on praying. To don't stop praying when things get hard or when things get tough or when things are no longer ideal, but to press through and pray. And so Paul says, we pray always for you to this end. Paul's what in his prayer begins with these words, that our God may make you worthy of his calling. Paul's what in his prayer starts with, may the Lord make you worthy of his calling. Paul wants us to live up to the name that God has assigned us. God calls us children of God. God calls us saints of God. God calls us followers and disciples of 
the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls us servants of the King Jesus. He calls us a holy nation. He calls us a royal priesthood. He calls us a peculiar people. And all of that he establishes by grace. See, the name that we've been given is not a name that we've earned, but it's one that was purchased for us by Christ. The Bible tells us for, for our sake he became sin. He who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What we discussed earlier, his sacrifice on our behalf places us in favor with God, though we, are, we aren't deserving of that favor based on our own merit. Does that make sense? We are called righteous by God or the righteousness of God, not based on us, but based on him. And so the name is a gift to us. But what Paul is praying is that we live up to the name. To be who we've already been declared to be. And so he's not telling you to work so that you can earn the name. He's telling you to just live up to the name. You're already righteous. So go and be who you are. Be righteous. Live out your identity in Jesus Christ. Paul is asking for them to continue in the sanctification that God continues to demonstrate through them. So Paul sees their sanctification. He's thankful for it. He's boasting in it. He's encouraging them to continue to hope in it. Now he's praying, don't stop. Continue in the momentum that we see in you. Does that make sense? So in other words, as you see brothers and sisters around you persevering through suffering, that doesn't mean, oh, okay, they're good. I don't need to pray for them anymore. Paul says, no, it's what releases me to go and pray for them. And say, Lord, continue to do the work that I see you're doing so marvelously in them. Notice what else is accompanied by, by Paul's or, or, or is found in Paul's prayer. He says that we always pray for you that our God may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. So in making you worthy of his calling, Paul is asking the Lord to continue equipping the Thessalonians for the work that he has called them to. Paul is not praying for a group of people who are experiencing suffering just to be given enough to get by. Paul is actually praying for those who are experiencing suffering but are flourishing in God despite the suffering to continue flourishing in God by asking God to give them everything they need to fulfill the unique mission he's given them. We are all on assignment on this earth. And we are all hit with all sorts of obstacles by the enemy and by the world and by, our, and by the flesh to keep us from fulfilling our assignment. But Paul is praying that they would continue to move in the assignment that God has tasked them with, regardless of the persecution that is trying to obstruct their fulfillment of that assignment. Also take notice where the power is coming from. It's not a power of their own making. He says that they will fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. He's not praying for willpower for them. He's praying for divine power for them to charge and energize the fulfillment of the good work that God has assigned them to. Does that make sense? As you see your brothers and sisters struggling through life, how many of you are praying for God's power to be at work mightily in them? As you see your spouse struggling, as you see your children struggling, how many of you are praying for God's power to be mighty at work in them? The work that, he's, that, that has been going on in the Thessalonians has been given to them by God's power. And so he looks to God to continue that work in them. And then lastly, he prays that, that this, this, this prayer that I'm praying, that God would make you worthy of the calling to be who you already are, to be who you've already been named, and that he may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. To, to, to live on the assignment that God has given you through the power that he has offered. He prays that this prayer be fulfilled so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, in you and him. The end of all prayers, the end of all prayers is that God may be glorified. 
in us and we in him. That's the end of our prayers. That's the checks and balances of our prayers. Are you tracking with that? As you pray, are you praying a prayer in order that God may be glorified in you and you in him? And that should inform and shape your prayers. Some prayers die immediately if you think about that, don't they? <laughs> right? Just stop. I don't even know why I'm praying that prayer, right? Just, <laughs> okay, okay, God, moving on, right? I mean, it's just immediately it stops because, because, because we know that it's not, it is not unto him, that, uh, unto him that we're asking this request be granted. It's unto me. But the end of all prayers is, is shaped and molded by this ideal of glorifying God. And so Paul is praying these prayers that he's praying with this state of mind that he prays them in for the glory of God. He's saying, I want them to, be, to, 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 to actually live out the name that you've assigned them for your glory. And I want them to have the power from you to fulfill the assignment that you have given them for your glory. Does that make sense? Notice what Paul doesn't pray. Sometimes we see them pray this, but, sometimes, but a lot of times we see them not pray this. And that is this, for the suffering man. It's not on the radar for him. It's not that he doesn't care about the suffering. It's just it's not on the radar. Paul leans into the reality of persecution, into the honesty of suffering, for the sake of Jesus Christ. And basically says to them and to us, if you're spending all your time praying for it simply to end, you're not fully understanding the purpose of prayer. See, Paul is confronting us with the tension that some suffering carries no end. And some of these Christians will die persecuted for the sake of Jesus Christ. The many Christians in this day, in this church, and throughout history, and even today, right now, in many places, die for his sake. Sometimes people will not like the stands that we take for Christ. Sometimes you will take a stance and you will not be cheered. You will not be celebrated. And you can take that stance as lovingly as you possibly can, and you still won't be promoted. Sometimes people will despise you for just simply saying that this is where Jesus stands and so I stand here with him. Paul's basic prayer, he moves the prayer to something more important rather than persecution ending. There's something even more important than persecution ending. And it's this, for us, for the Thessalonians and for us to continue growing thriving, flourishing in our walk with Jesus, even in the midst of it. We've talked about this before, but part of the trouble with comfort is our inability to see God when we don't have it. We simply just don't see God because we've had so much comfort, so when discomfort comes, we lose sight of God, and we act like he's not working in that. But he is working in that. He not only wants to just simply end it, he's trying to mature you in a way that regardless of it, you are still flourishing in him. True Christian maturity isn't the ability to thrive in God when the conditions are perfect. True Christian maturity is found when we thrive and look to God when the conditions are anything but perfect. God talks, when, when the devil talks to Job, I'm sorry, when the devil talks to God about Job in the book of Job, God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a mature Christian in the faith. The devil says, well, you got a hedge of protection around him and you're keeping, all, you're keeping him protected. He has everything he needs. And then the devil says this, will he serve you for nothing? If I take everything away and he has nothing but you, will he serve you? And that's the test. 
The test of whether or not Job has grown in full maturity in Christ, in full maturity in God, is the ability for Job, when he has nothing else but God, to still serve God. To say, that's enough. And so God oftentimes allows the experiences because this is part of the maturation teaching you to flourish, to say that God is enough. Yes, the job is tough, but God is enough. Yes, the children are going crazy, but God is enough. Yes, the marriage is hard, but God is enough. Yes, the, the, the schooling is hard, but God is enough. Yes, yes, all this is hard. Yes, life is hard, but God is enough. Some of y'all are praying for suffering to end when it should be prayers that, Lord, teach me how to still see you in the midst of it. And if it ends, so be it. But if it doesn't, I still want you. Teach me to want you regardless. That's the prayer. And it's not to make light of your suffering, fam. I grieve with you as you suffer. But it should just point you to the reality that God is pointing you to something higher than that. That's what Paul is showing us in this text. So are you praying these kinds of prayers? Not just for you. But are you praying these kinds of prayers for the people around you? people in this room? Are you praying these kinds of prayers that God would mature us, not just in our comfort, but that he would mature us in our suffering? Are you praying that God would send us fully equipped to perform work and live on mission, not just when conditions are ideal, but when conditions are hard? And the last words that Paul leaves us with tie the whole thing together. He says, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the prayer is fueled by the grace that we've been given in Jesus. That when Christ died, he purchased your salvation, but he also purchased the fulfillment and the answer to prayers such as these. When Christ died, he purchased not just your salvation, but he purchased your sanctification. The progression to grow in him, to mature in him through suffering and through hardship. And when he died, he purchased not just your sanctification, but he purchased your glorification. The hope and the promise that one day we will see him, and when we see him, we will be like him. When he what he purchased for you was the whole package when he died. And it's to that end that Paul prays, or it's with that fuel that Paul prays. And it's with that fuel that you and I should pray. Amen.